Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem minimum operations to make a uni value grid. So what that means is we are given a two dimensional grid over here. It's not necessarily going to be a square like this one. The dimensions might be different. Let's call them n by m. And there's going to be a bunch of random integers filled into this grid. We're also given a second parameter x. What we can do is take x and either subtract it from any number or add it to any number. So we could do 4 plus 2 or we could do 4 minus 2. We could also do this an unlimited number of times. So for example, like let's say I look at the number 8 over here. I could subtract 2 from it once, I could subtract 2 from it twice or three times, like an unlimited number of times, however many times I want. Or I could do the opposite, I could add 2 to it however many times I want. To put it in more general terms, I like to think of it like this, like any number, 8, 6, whatever, we could add or subtract from it this x times, let's say, uh, I, I don't know the variable, let's call it i, I don't know what's a good variable name for this, but really it's the quantity. So uh, n or uh, I don't know y. y is like the number of times we're adding or subtracting x from this number. And we get to decide what this is. We do not get to decide what this is. Now, our goal is just to make every single element in the grid the exact same. And not only that, but we want to return the minimum number of operations to make the grid such that every value is the same, if it's possible. If it's not possible, return negative one. The first question that kind of comes to my mind is, how do we know if it's actually possible to do this or not? Like, is that something we can easily determine or is that difficult to determine? It seems like it would be related to math, like this number would matter. Let's try to think of a case where it would not be possible. In this example, it actually is possible. Just to kind of walk you through that, what we would do is add two here a single time. We would leave the four the same. We would subtract two from six and then we would subtract two twice from eight. The total number of operations is one, two, three, four. So we would return four. Now, in what example would that not be the case? It's actually very, very simple to think of one. Let me show you. I'm literally just gonna count zero, one, and I'm gonna set my X value to two now. I'm using a very, very simple example just to illustrate this fact, which is this. In this example, you can see, I have one number over here, he's even. I have another number over here, which is odd. I have a x, which is obviously even. So if you take an even number and keep adding it to an odd number, it's gonna stay odd no matter how many times you do it. If you subtract it from an odd number, it's gonna stay odd no matter how many times you do it. Uh, similarly, an even number, add it to an even number, it's gonna stay even no matter what. If you subtract it from an even number, it's gonna stay even no matter what. Think of it like this. I have many different ways to kind of show you this. You can pick whichever one you prefer. Uh, for example, just kind of continuing the original one. So right now I just have a number line here. So I had a number zero. So I'm going to put like a circle at zero. And I had my X was equal to two. So from zero, I can hop over here, put a circle there. I can hop over there, put a circle there. Same thing pretty much. And same thing. Now I could do the same thing with one. So I'll put a circle over here for one. And then with X, I can keep hopping. I'm over here and then there and then there. So very obvious that these are never going to sort of intersect. Another mathematical way, you're probably tired of this part. You probably are convinced of this, but I'm going to show you another way you could think about this, which is also somewhat helpful. Imagine I have an X, Y axis. And again, imagine I'm thinking of the example where I have zero and I have one and my X is equal to two. Well, that's pretty much like saying, okay, at the origin, I'm starting at zero because my X, I'm not using it any times. And then after that, well, then I can go over here to two and then I can go over here to four and I can just, you know, draw this line. And similarly, we could have the one over here and then we can add two to it however many times we want. We would get three, we would get five, etc. So you can think this is kind of just like an algebra problem in some ways, right? A system of linear equations. But anyways, this is kind of a long-winded way to say that there are many ways to think about this, but the easiest one is probably to use something called mod math. Because if I take any number from here, like they, there could have been more numbers as well. Let's, to make it more interesting, put in like a nine or something. Any of these numbers, I could take nine and then mod it 
by my x value. So basically, like if you think of it in terms of one of these lines, when we say mod, we're dividing this by two. So we're eliminating twos from it. Okay, eliminate a two, eliminate a two, and keep going until you get to the remainder. Maybe the remainder is zero, or maybe the remainder is a non-zero value. But either way, modding that number will tell us something. And if all the mods are the same, all the lines have to be the exact same for us to eventually be able to make all these values equal. So I only drew two lines here, but you can imagine we could have had the line with nine as well. And I think that line actually would have intersected with this orange one, because when we mod nine by a two, we get one. Anyways, I think I'm overcomplicating this part. So let me kind of go back to the basic part, which is that you take this number zero, in this case, mod it by two, well, the remainder is going to be zero. You take one, you mod it by two, and you get one. Remainder is one. If they have a different remainder, it's impossible for us to make these numbers equal. They have to have the exact same remainder. Every single number in here has to have the exact same remainder when we divide it by x. So that's easily a way for us to determine if this is possible or not. Now, if it is possible, this is an interesting observation to make. If it is possible, then that theoretically means that like if we go back to that like previous drawing that I kind of had, just to like give you a rough idea of it, was something like this, right? Where we had lines like this. Now, if every value can be made the same, then like no matter where the values start, like let's say for eight, it starts over here. Great. Well, maybe four starts over here. Great. Well, maybe six starts over here. Great. And then two just starts over here. Well, it looks like they could all be made equal. I can choose. Well, how many operations would it take to make them all into a two? I don't know. How many operations would it take to make them a four? How many operations to make them all a six, to make them an eight? So now at least we kind of have an idea of a solution. It seems like it's a brute force solution so far. It's probably gonna be something of an n squared solution where let's say n is the total number of elements in the grid, but at least we're kind of getting there. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is what I mean. So for the brute force solution, we could do something like this, where now I want to answer the question, how many operations does it take to make everybody a two? Okay, what do I do? I scan through every single element in this input and I take the difference between two and every single number. Okay, well this one is zero, nothing to do there. The difference with this one is a positive two. That can be done with a single operation. We know that because we just take this two and divide it by X, which will give us one. And we know that this will always be a round number. It's not going to be a fraction because of this picture. We know every number can be made the same. So, so far, so good. Okay, we counted one operation so far. And with six, the difference is four. Four divided by two is going to be two, two operations there. And then with eight, we count a difference of a six from two. So that's going to be three more operations. So that was one, three, six total operations to make everybody a two. Is that the minimum? Well, so far we can say it's the minimum, six operations. And then we would try the next question, four. How many operations does it take to make everybody a four? Same exact thing, two, the difference between four, well, the absolute difference would be two, so that's one operation. With four, the difference is zero. With six, the difference is two. Eight, the difference is four. So that's one, two, four operations total. And we keep going like this. So now you can kind of see why this solution, if we say this is n and this is m, this is going to mean n times m squared solution. Okay, how can we make it better? Well, the idea is relatively simple, but it's going to involve a little bit of pre-processing, aka sorting these numbers. Because as we kind of went through the brute force solution, imagine if instead of having a grid, we had a sorted array. I mean, these elements are kind of already sorted, so that kind of helps us build the intuition. But the reason sorting would help us is because then we can cut down on some of the repeated work. This is what I mean. I mean, I'm going to have a prefix instead of having 
uh, a single number. So this is how the algorithm is going to work. This is the idea behind it. If I was at some arbitrary element, like this is where my pointer is currently, we're going to start the pointer here. We're going to iterate over the entire thing. Every time the pointer lands on an element, we're going to ask the question, how many operations would it take to make every value a six? Try to think for a second. If you had a prefix sum and also you had the total sum of the entire array, which is pretty easy to get in linear time, is it possible that you'd be able to answer this question knowing that this array is sorted? Would you be able to answer that question in constant time? Well, I would, and this is how I would do it. I'd say, okay, my prefix sum right now is six. My I pointer right now, I'm at index two. So this is uh, the prefix sum so far. So how many operations would it take to make this array every value be a six? Well, I don't have to look at every single value. I already know all of them can be made a six. So here's what I do. I say, okay, the length of this prefix is two. So the sum of the prefix should be two times, not X, sorry, it should be two times the current number because we're trying to make this current number filled in here and here. So it should be two times six, right? That's what the sum should be. And so then we subtract from that the real prefix sum six. So two times six minus six, and then we get a six left over. Can you guess what we're going to do with this six? We're going to say, well, the left side needs six more. It's impossible for any of these elements to be greater than six because the array is sorted. So we don't expect to have to decrease any of those elements. We increase them and it looks like we have to increase them by six. How many operations is that going to be? Just take six, divide it by X. You get three operations. Okay. So now I did the left side for you. How would we go about doing the right side? It's actually a little bit more complicated. We would take the total sum, which is this total in this case is going to be, I believe, uh, 20. So I'll use a different color. A total is going to be 20. We're going to subtract from that the prefix sum, which is 60 so or 6. Sorry. Uh, we see that on the left over here because obviously we want to eliminate this. We want to only look at the right side over here. And specifically for every element to the right of this one, I mean, I know that in this example, there's only a single one. To make it a bit more interesting, let's add like a 10 over here. Now there's a couple. What do we want to do? I mean, we know that our current index is over here. Well, we probably should get rid of like the current element, the six itself. And then from each of these, we want to subtract six. So like for subtracting six from that, we get two. Subtracting six from that, we get four. And we want to know what is this total sum that's left over. It's not super difficult to do. All you have to do is realize that you're subtracting six from here and from here and from here. So all you do is get the length of this, which is going to be the length of the array uh, minus, uh, well, the length of the array won't be four, it'll actually be five minus the current index, which will be two, which will give us three. So I think that works out. So we would do that. So in this example, I um, mean, it's kind of hard to draw, but like three times six because six is the current element. And now I realize that since I added this 10 over here, I should probably add that 10 to this. So the total will actually be 30. So now our math will actually work out. When we uh, calculate this, we will get 30 minus 24. That should be six, I believe. So that means six divided by X means that we have three operations. So whatever operations we counted here, I think was three. So six total operations to make everybody in this array a six. And you saw how I did that in constant time. Then we would just shift the pointer. We'd move to the next position. Now we'd say, okay, this is added to the prefix sum. This is the prefix sum now. This is the current element. And we just restart and continue the process from there. So this will be linear time. Well, it would almost be linear time, but there is some sorting involved. So I guess more accurately, the time complexity, if this is n by m, would be something like uh, n m log n m, something like that, I think. And I believe it's going to be constant space. Okay, so there's a few things we're going to do. So I'm going to actually add some comments first. The first thing is we're going to check all remainders of every element in the grid because that's going to allow us to determine if it's actually possible to make them all the same. After that, we're going to flatten the grid and turn it into an array so we can flatten and sort the input. And then after that, we're going to do the prefix sum 
suffix some sort of solution. So let's get into that. What I'm going to do is go through every row in the grid and then every element in that row. And I'm going to check if the remainder of that element, let's say remainder of this with X has to be equal to some element in the array. So we can just arbitrarily pick one because this loop is going to make sure that they're all the same. So we can choose grid at index 00, zero to be that fixed value. So we'll check if this is not equal to the origin value modded by X. Well, then we should return false. Otherwise, we assume that everything is valid by the time that we get here. And then we want to sort and flatten the array. So I'm going to build the array like this. Python makes it pretty easy with list comprehension. Check out my Python for coding interviews course if you want to check that out. This is actually going to be, I think, listed list comprehension. So for row in grid, we're going to go through every element in that row, and then we're going to get that element. And then we could sort this after. We could do this, nums.sort, or we could just sort it here. We could do sorted like that. That'll create a new copy of the array which I guess in some ways is less efficient, but it saves us a line of code. It doesn't really matter though. This is basically like the same nested loops that I have up here n is being added to the array. But like I said, nested list comprehension is covered in the Python for Coding Interviews course if you are interested in checking that out. It has a bunch of interactive lessons and teaches you a bunch of these concepts. Okay, now we're done with the first two phases. The third phase is going to be the most time consuming. But it's not going to be too bad as long as we can keep track of our variables uh, correctly. So prefix going to be zero. Total going to be the sum of all the numbers. Probably could have computed that up here as well if we wanted to, but not a big deal. And our result, since we're trying to minimize it, we can set it to a really big number initially. Let's do float of infinity. And then we're going to go through every position. So for i in range length of nums. What I want to do is determine what's the cost on the left and the cost on the right. So I'll have my variables cost left. So this is going to be uh, just to make it clear. Imagine our array is this and we are at six. Well, we want six times the length of this part. So we'll take the current number nums of I times um, I should give us the length of this. Our current index, if it's two, should be the length of this and then subtract from that the actual prefix sum. The prefix sum at this point should just be two, four. So here we will subtract the prefix sum. That's why I'm gonna actually put this part prefix sum, add the current number to it at the end, because right now it's not the prefix. It'll only become part of the prefix at the end of the loop. And then the next iteration will treat it as the prefix. Okay, so, so far so good there. Now for cost at right, similar thing, but now we're gonna take the total array and subtract from it the prefix. That's pretty easy, minus that. And then also minus six times the length of this part. So that's going to be uh, this minus this nums of i times the length, which is this length of nums minus just i, I believe, because the length will be over here. I will be there, so it'll get that. So the length of that should be this plus that. Okay, so we got the cost, but the cost doesn't tell us the number of operations. It really just tells us the difference. Like this is how much we need to add to the left side. This is how much we need to subtract from the right side. Either way, we can get the total number of operations like this, cost of left plus the cost of right, and then just divide that by X. And now we want to minimize the total number of operations. So do this, result is minimum of result and the operations. So I will get rid of this code. And then at the end, we can just go ahead and return the result. So you can see here that these are kind of my phases. This is phase one, phase two, and phase three. I feel like this code is mostly a readable, so let's run it. And I'm an idiot. Of course, I returned false over here when we're actually supposed to return an integer, which is negative one. So let me do that. And now you can see that this solution works. I think it's more efficient than like this is letting us believe. I think maybe the fact that I created a sorted copy probably affected that as well. So maybe if we do this and maybe if we just total up the sum at the top, it'll help us just a tiny bit. I'm not sure though. So here total plus equal N let's give that a run. 
And okay, it's not really much better, but anyways, it's not like this is majorly less efficient. But anyways, if you found this helpful, check out Neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.